Mabayim, welcome. Just want to give a warm welcome to Rabbi Kaplan from Eretz Israel. After having uh, multiple uh, plane rides and switching planes, uh, it's great to have you with us here. And um, really, he does not need my introduction. We had him before at KBT, and it has been always a great pleasure and honor to have him with us. Uh, you know, the topic of tonight is an interesting one. It's hard to speak to a crowd that is half married and half dating. Um, and we put it on him to, to speak about marriage and Shalom Bayit, dating and Shalom Bayit. But I was thinking, really, in the parasha, we have the only combination of such uh, concept because Moshe Rabbeinu's parents, who are not introduced in the parasha to us who they are, and um, they were married, they had children, and then they separated because of the difficulties of the time, and then they dated back and married again, got back with, with each other. So really, it's a concept that relationships and knowing how a successful relationship is formed and forged, you keep on dating your spouse as being married is always fresh and always keeping it um, as something exciting is really the yesod, the constant, the fu fundamental concept of marriage is to have this newness, like the Gemara says in the second parak of Masechet Nida. And at the same time, dating is always successful when you're looking forward to a marriage. Is, you know, they, they had this, this research of who could draw a straight line in sand from point A to point B, and the only person that did it, they asked him, how did he do it? All the other people didn't do it. They ended up going like this, and he ended up being zigzag. I said, all the other people were looking at where the stick is in the sand and trying to make it straight. I had one eye on where the stick is and one eye at the end. You always have to think of future to build so dating really is successful when you're thinking of the goals of marriage. Really, they go hand in hand, and um, it's an honor and privilege to have Rabbi Kaplan with us to address this very important topic. Maybe I can move the stender over here a little bit to be more centered. I can move it over. I can move it over. I mean, we could move it over. Thank you very much. I think we could move it over, even though I had no intent whatsoever to touch it. You notice that? that, that that's the first lesson in marriage. It's like when your, wife, when your wife says to you, we need to call the washing machine guy. Oh, we, huh? we, we need to call the yeah, we, yeah, 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 me or, me or you? Yeah, you, <laughs> yeah, we. So it's, uh, it was one of the highlights of my trip last time was being here in this wonderful show with the wonderful Rav at the Kehila. And uh, so it is a, a little bit of a challenge uh, speaking about dating and marriage uh, together, but uh, uh, you know, I'm still a little off center. Maybe I could ask everybody over here. So I just feel awkward because I'm, I'm talking to the Kaisel over here. <laughs> And they say that in Israel that a girl goes to the Kaisel the day before, before she gets married, she always goes to the Kaisel, she goes to the Western Wall the night before her marriage, so she should get used to talking to a wall. But the, the uh, there we go, much better. Um, so, it just by way of introduction, uh, uh, there were two young ladies who were having a conversation and one of them said to the other one, this is the state of uh, marriage in the 21st century, uh, one of them said to the other one, when I go out with a guy, I ask myself, is this the man I want my children to spend every other weekend with? <laughs> <laughs> Which unfortunately is not funny, it's, uh, it is funny, but it's not funny because that's the state of marriage in the world at large today. Marriage is uh, almost for, it's an almost undefined concept today, what, what marriage is, what people are expecting. As the Rav mentioned, I had a student here 
um, I have a student who's actually from L.A. He lives in L.A. today. And when he got to Or Sameach many years ago, they came into Or Sameach. We're going back now close to probably over 30 years. And he came in, and I sat down and started speaking to him. And I said to him, I asked him, uh, we started schmoozing for, for a while. And then at a certain point, I asked him a very provocative question. I said to him, what's your goal in life? which is a question that stumps many people. I said, what's your goal in life? So he said to me, the time he was attending Ohio State University, and he said that he was a member of the Ohio State University marching band. And he plays the tuba. He's a tuba player. And he told me that in the biggest game of the year when Ohio State University plays Michigan, and they, uh, at halftime, the biggest, it's a big rivalry. Ohio State and Michigan is a tremendous rivalry. My wife happens to be from Columbus, Ohio. It's not my fault, that's where she's from. And uh, Ohio State's in Columbus. And a tremendous rivalry in uh, Ohio State, Michigan. And, and the big game, and that weekend, if anybody has Michigan license plates and they're in, in Columbus, you can forget about your car. Your car is going to be trashed. And uh, at halftime of the biggest game of the year, the marching band comes out. And the senior tuba player, they spell out, the marching band spells out in human formation, they spell out the words Ohio State. And the senior tuba player then has the singular honor and distinction of being the guy who gets to dot the I in the word Ohio. And he said to me, that's his goal in life, is to dot the I in Ohio. Yeah, I'm looking at him, and I, I have to try to remain, uh, you know, accepting and unshocked and... I'm just looking and thinking to myself, well, what comes next? I mean, then you get to cross the T, you know, well, you know well, well, that's some goal. And I realized, you know, what, and what comes afterwards? You know, where, where, where do you go from here? So the truth of the matter is that that's one of the problems that many people have when they go into marriage. People don't have a goal. People get married often because, well, that's the next stage. That, that, you know, that's the next thing to do. You know, you got your degree, you got your job. May as well get married and then, uh, then see what happens. Life doesn't work that way. Life doesn't work. There's got to be a goal. There's got to be a goal. And Torah marriage, Torah marriage has a goal. Marriage is not an ends in and of itself. Marriage is a means to the one ends that we live with all the time. And the, the goal of a Torah Jew, the goal of any Jew, is that we are here to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Marriage is one of the ways we serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu. One of the ways we serve Hashem is by getting married. That's one of the commands in the Torah. That's a way of serving. It is not, does not exist in a vacuum. And therefore it has to be known, number one, that a Torah marriage is a completely different concept than marriage, marriage the way the, the world sees marriage today, number one. And this applies to people, whether you're married, whether you're single, uh, uh, number one. Number two, um, a big rov, Ravarn Feldman, who's the Rosh Hashiva of Neri Israel in Baltimore, so he once told us, a man came to him and he was lamenting about the fact that he was having trouble with one of his sons, a teenager. I mean, the fact that he's a teenager is already a problem. But he was having trouble with, with one of his kids. And he said to him, finally, he said, wow, you know, this is just the most difficult relationship. And Ralph Feldman said to him, it's true that it's difficult, but the most difficult relationship is still in always Shalom Bayes marriage. That's the most difficult relationship. And I'll explain to you why. And I'm talking about in a good marriage, by the way. I'm talking about in a good marriage. In a good marriage, Shalom bias is always the most challenging. The most challenging guy. And I'll, I'll tell you why. When you have a son, a daughter, so, you know, no matter what they're doing to you, no matter what they're putting you through, for a few hours a day, they're out of sight and out of mind. You know, you have your son, he's either in school for eight hours a day, or he's with his parole officer for eight hours a day, or wherever he happens to be, but at least he's, you know, for eight hours a day, he's out of your head. Your spouse, your husband, can never be out, a husband, a, a wife can never be out of her husband's mind. The husband may think she's out of her mind, but he can never, she can never be out of his mind. The classic example, anybody who's married, if you're married for any great length of time, like about 10 minutes, then you'll be able to relate to this. You know, a husband comes home, and his wife has made a beautiful dinner for him, and he sits down to eat dinner, and he has a piece of chicken. And he has one piece of chicken. Wife says, the chicken wasn't good. He says, no, it's delicious. So why did you only have one piece? This is a guy who normally has two or three. You know, sometimes he goes up to four or five. If it's really, you know, 
And he only has one piece of chicken. And the wife says, why, why do you only have one piece of chicken? He says, well, on the way home, I had a Danish. He says, you didn't tell me. And, like, you have to report these things. You know, there's a Danish patrol. You know, you have to, you have to report these things. Now, what happened was, what happened was, what happened here? What happened was, he says, the husband, on the way home, he had a Danish, which is nothing wrong with it. On the other hand, he should have at least let his wife, call your wife, let her know, put supper away for later, I'm going to have a Danish doctor because I'm kind of hungry after work, whatever it is. He forgot he wasn't thinking about her. And she went and made a meal for him, and the husband simply took his focus off. And therefore, in the relationship, it's a 24-hour-a-day relationship. It's a 24-hour-a-day constant thought. The wife has to be thinking about the husband 24 You know, husband's wife, sit down, I'm sure you've been there, you make a budget. And it's one of the things you make a budget. Talk about things that cause fights in marriage, right? So you make a budget. Husband and wife make a budget. And then one day the husband comes home and I says, so by the way, I bought a new sweater today. Really? How much was it? Oh, it was $80. I mean, we spoke about this, didn't we? I mean, we, we talked about this, about, you know, let's talk it over. Let's have it. And what's it going to be next? How many, are you going to be another one tomorrow? I mean, uh, you know, next thing you know, you're going to buy a boat, right? Men always go from sweater to boat. Right? You ever notice that? Men go from sweater to boat very quickly. Now, I know a lot of people in Israel, not one of them has a boat. Wives have sweaters, no boats. I haven't seen any boats in Yerushalayim. I haven't seen any boats in the firm community anywhere. There are no boats. What happened over here? There's nothing wrong with the wife having money to spend. How's husband should give his wife money to spend. And, but you, you made an agreement. You're, you, you, a wife, you, you know, think about it. Call, make a phone call. Just call them up. By the way, I, I have a, the credit card with me. I think I'm going to buy a boat. <laughs> what? <laughs> Just kidding. A sweater. Right. Oh, okay. That'll be okay. Once you're down there, if you're down, you know, what do you call it? Then, then it'll work. The point is that it's a constant, it's a 24-hour connection. A person has to understand that when they're married, they are not living on their own. A person is married, there is somebody else in your life that is constantly everything that you're doing. Now, there's a, a, a remarkable statement. The Gemara says, Hashori below Isha, Shori below Shalom. A man without a wife is without peace. He's without Shalom. Now, I want to tell you something. I was baffled by that statement. Absolutely baffled. Without a wife, you have no Shalom. I had a roommate, in, when I was in Yeshiva, I had a roommate for about a year and a half. We never had even close to any sort of conflict whatsoever. Neither of us minded the other guy leaving clothes on the floor, uh, uh, you know, leaving empty cups all over the place. We, we had no problem whatsoever. I was married for about 20 minutes and already had my first conflict. It didn't take me long. I'm good. No, no I'm good at this. It didn't take me long. We were taking pictures after the, after the chuppah. They, they take the photographer comes in. He's the most important person at the chasna, obviously, much more important than the husband wife or the rabbi or anybody else. And we were taking pictures after my wedding. And I was, I'd had about enough of it because, you know, they always have, at the weddings, they make every single combination possible. Chassan, Kala with Uncle Harold and Cousin Sidney, you know, and everybody, and it was going on and dragging for a while. And at a certain point, I started making gestures at the photographer. I started, you know, I was going like this, and we have another picture of me going like this. And I was laughing, and he was laughing. And there's a lady in, dressed in white standing next to me. And she was smiling at the photographer. I remember she's smiling, and she says, can you please cut that out? And I'm like, whoa, she speaks. <laughs> you know, that, was, that was my introduction. That was my introduction, you know, I, I had no, so what does it mean, hashori below isha, shori below shalom? If you're without a wife, you're without shalom. I had, I had shalom for a year and a half before that, I had great shalom. Right, what, what happened over here? And then I got married, it was shalom to the shalom. You know, what, what, what happened? The answer is shalom is not the absence of conflict. Israel and Egypt have not had a conflict since 1973. They haven't had a conflict. It doesn't mean they're in a state of shalom. It doesn't mean they're in a state of uh, uh, a ceasefire. That's all it is. It's not actual peace. It's not shalom. Shalom is an active. Shalom is something that you have to build. Shalom is not something passive. Shalom is something that is active. And the Torah approach to shalom bias, the Torah approach to shalom bias, it begins with dating. Now, when you're dating, you know, somebody once said, people go out looking for their other half. Right? Isn't that the expression, I have to find the other half? The problem is that in life, to find the other half, you have to find the first half first. 
can't find the other half if you don't have the first half. And what that means is that a person who is found themselves means that they have a goal, they know where they want to go, they know what they're trying to do. You know, couples get together, married couples will sometimes get together and talk about home improvements. Ever happened to you? Talk about home improvements. By the way, somebody once said, women think that communication, that communication means, because marriage is all about communication, right? Effective communication. Women think that communication means agreeing with them. So for example, a wife will say to a husband, do you think we need to get a new couch? And I said, no, I don't think so. For the old couch is fine. And the wife says, we're just not communicating. Now, I thought that was great communication. You know, you want to get a couch? I said, no. Well, communication means right, true or not true. So you have to, that's, that's effective communication means, means agreeing. So it, it, when a couple will get together, sometimes talk about, you know, what we need to do, we need to paint a little bit, we need to improve, we need to, they're, they're home improvements, physical home improvements. How many couples sit down and talk about what we'll call spiritual home improvements? Where can we sit down? Where can we improve in our goals? Where can we maybe work on speaking less Lush and Hara? Where can we work on perhaps where I'll have more time, the husband should have more time to learn Torah? Where can we, what should we do about opening our home or having guests or the influence on our children or technology or anything else? So a couple has to have, the person, an individual has to have a goal where they're trying to get to in order for the couple to have a goal, a united goal. So before going out and dating, and you see what dating looks like in the world at large, a person obviously has to have a focus on where they're trying to get to, and therefore they can find the kind of spouse that they're looking for that has similar life goals. Now obviously there's going to have to be what they call chemistry, which was not my best subject in high school. Hopefully it's better in marriage. But the, there's got to be a chemistry, and there's got to be obviously a mutual communication, and so on and so forth. But at, the, at a minimum, there's got to be, how many people think about that? How many people are really thinking about what are we trying to accomplish in a life up to 120 years? I may have an estrium in our 120 years. What are we trying to accomplish? And is this the person that, I want, that, that will help, uh, help me and that I can help her? And jointly, unitedly, we could accomplish it together. So now I'm going to tell you something which the men are not going to be so pleased about. But... Uh, this is a fact. I can't, uh, I can't change facts. I'm only telling you what the truth is. The Abarbanel, one of the great commentaries in the Torah, he asks, why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu make it that marriage is so challenging? Why couldn't it be that men and women have to be different biologically so that the world could continue, but they should be mentally, emotionally, and logically, in, in all ways, we should be alike. That way a husband and wife could sit down and you could have a nice dinner together, then plop down on the couch and enjoy the football game together. And everybody has a mutual interest. But no, he wants to watch the football game and she wants to go to the Italian opera to hear some lady wailing in Italian about how her husband killed her boyfriend or something like that. And why can't they just, why can't everything, why can't it be, why does this have to be so challenging? You know what the Barbanel answers? And gentlemen, I apologize in advance. They don't throw anything. The Abarbanel says because men have to learn how to not be so selfish, self-centered, egotistical, immature, every other negative adjective you could possibly think of, and they have to learn how to give to somebody who is so different than themselves. You like that, huh? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. you better put the mechitza up again, by the way. <laughs> So, yeah, and by the way, if you throw stuff over the mechit, so the men are going to throw shoes, the ladies are going to throw coins, you know, yeah, go ahead, throw them. Yeah, so you have to understand, it's not a joke, it's not a joke, because there's so many, you know, just something simple, just something, yeah, let me give you, I'll give you an example, you know, a man, a husband comes home, and his wife says to him, uh, 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 yeah, or, or a husband comes home, says to the wife, do you want to eat out tonight? A wife is likely to say, what do you mean? Right. Not, wait, which word did you understand? Do you want to go with me to eat? What was, what, was not, what, was, what was not clear about that? The answer is because how would a wife, what would a wife say to a husband? A husband walks into the house and the wife says, do the lights look dim? Do the lights look dim? Now I know the lights don't look dim because we just put in new lights two weeks ago. 
She's saying to me, the lights look dim. That means that she's been in the house a long time all day. She wants to get out. She wants to go out to eat. So the answer when a wife says, do the lights look dim, is milchiks or fleishiks. <laughs> so when a husband comes home and says to his wife, do you want to go out to eat? Now, she would never say that. No, let's go out to eat. She would say, do the lights look dim? So when a husband comes home and says, do you want to go out to eat? Now she gets nervous. You don't like my cooking? You don't like my mother? You don't like my mother? What do so, so when, when you, you understand now, what, why, why do that? Why does a wife communicate instead of communicating like this? Why does she have to communicate like this? And the answer is that a husband has to, it's for us. It's for us. You have to learn. Don't get impatient. Don't get what you call it. You have to deal with somebody who is so different than yourself. And you have to give to her. And you have to make her happy. And you have to make her happy the rest of your life. I'd have asked her. That's what the Torah is telling you. That's why. And if it was only those little communication things. By the way, just look at the way men and women speak to each other. Watch men and women. Watch two women speaking to each other. When two women speak to each other, there is direct eye contact like this. Their faces are usually about an inch and a half away from each other. They even turn their heads in sync. They look at each other. And all you hear them saying is things like, oh, me too. Oh, I know what you mean. Oh, that's right. Oh, 100%. Now, when men speak to each other, men could be back to back. <laughs> and all you hear men saying things like, oh, that's not right. You're crazy. What are you talking about? That's no, not true. And we're talking about best friends over here. Now, the problem happens when you take one of each species and you put them together in a cage. <laughs> now you have a problem. And that's why there's a wife who says to her husband, husband says to her husband, you know, uh, uh, Johnny, John, you're not listening to me. He says, I hear every word you're saying, Mary. She goes, you're not listening with your eyes. Uh-huh. Oh, that's what eyes are for. Oh, I see, see, red gentlemen, eyes are for listening. I always thought eyes are for seeing. Right, but no, no, no. Eyes are for the, oh, really? Oh, really? Oh, 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 really? Wow. Oh, that's, oh, wow. And see, men have this issue about, men talk about things, facts. Let's get down. Talk to any man about anything, and you like to hear, how much did it cost? You know, one of the big words among men is bucks. Uh, that's what you're going to hear. It was this amount of bucks, that amount of bucks. Women need to share how they feel. I, I felt. You know, I, I, so when you get these, the, when you get it together, when you get two of them together, and by the way, the biggest, how, how, many, of you are, yes, how, how many of you are married? How many of you are here are married? Okay. So, so you, should know, you should know that one of the problems in marriage one of the biggest problems in marriage is simply the Mesos Yisharim, we see Lat Yisharim, says that when we all know what behavior is inappropriate. We all know, for example, it's not nice to interrupt people when they speak, and it's not nice to, yeah, to be selfish, and it's not right to, to, have a, to, to, to be haughty and to be arrogant. We all know these things. So why do we do it anyway? Because we forget about it. It's out of, it's, it, it, we, we lose focus. The best and most important way to keep focus in marriage is that a person has to, uh, what I always recommend is you take a marriage book, and you go into any of the Jewish bookshops, by the way, and just with the books that are available are books that indicate what's going on in the particular generation. There are a lot of books out there about marriage, Shalom Bayes now. Tremendous amount of books about how to date, dating in Shalom Bayes. You can always tell the Shalom Bayes books, because it always looks like they always put their two doves on the cover, usually sharing a ring, right? I got news for you. If you got two doves in the house sharing a ring, you don't need a Shalom Bias book. They should have two vultures with baseball bats is what should be on the cover. Now there's a good Shalom Bias book for you. So when you see, if there's so many Shalom Bias books out there, I mean Shalom Bias is a challenge. What, what, what do you see in, in, child, in child raising? A lot of books on how to raise families now. Tremendous amount. Those of you in the room, I understand. You know, I was reminiscing with a friend of mine. Today when you raise, raise children, it's all about psychology. Right? All, it's all psychology. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? It's all psychology, this, psychology, that. Listen, when we grew up, I grew up in a generation, our fathers weren't psychologists. Our fathers were physical therapists. Right? And, you know, we, we did, you know, they did, that was it. You know, they, they, there was no, no psychology business. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, no psychology business. And it was okay, because I knew my father loved me. And if he applied some physical therapy, I deserved, I probably deserved more. So, so you, you, you know, you know, you have you have a situation over here, true or not true, and that was it. You know, let's let's go. Kid. Nowadays, uh, you got all these new expressions. 
my comfort zone. Right, a comfort zone, huh? <laughs> if I ever would have used that word, if my father would ask me to do something, I'd say, Dad, it, it, it's not in my comfort zone. I would have gotten it right in the comfort zone. You know, there was, no, there was no comfort zone in those days. Comfort zone? Who uses comfort zone? Of course, I'm going to move out of my comfort zone now. Right? There's no comfort zone. Oh, you're toxic. You know, toxic. Toxic used to be something on, on, on what do you call it, on, on laundry detergent. You know, they, they put a word, is it to toxic or non-toxic? Now these are all these new expressions. That's the world we're living in. Can't do anything about it. That's the challenge, and that's what the Abarbanel says in marriage. Marriage is a training ground for husbands. Because lo tove yosa odom levado, it is not good for man to be alone. And a man has to learn to give and to give and to give and to give. My brother is a Rebbe and another yeshiva. And uh, one of the Talmudim came to him, one of the boys came to my brother, and he said to him, uh, Rebbe, how do I know when I'm ready to get married? So my brother looked at him, he said, how do you know when you're ready to get married? How do you know when you're ready to get married? When you're tired of taking, 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 and all you want to do is give, 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 then you're ready for marriage. The guy looked at him like he got, he got oh, oh. Oh, 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 okay, oh, I, I, I got to think about this. Right? <laughs> last, last time he was seen, he was 97 and single. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's a completely different, the attitude of marriage. A lot of people think, what am I looking for in a spouse? What am I looking for in a spouse? This applies to the ladies as well. What am I looking for in a husband? What am I looking for in a wife? But a person has to ask themselves, and what am I bringing into the marriage? What am I going to contribute to the marriage? Not what am I looking for in somebody else. What am I looking, what, what am I going to bring in? What have I got to offer? What have I got to help out in achieving our life goals? So, one of the problems here, by the way, if anybody has any questions at any point, but I hold it, hold it to questions, not, uh, questions as opposed to comments. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to raise your hand and we'll, we'll you know, I'm sure if you have a question, everybody else in the room has the same question. Others have the same question as well. One of the problems here is that, you know, there's a story. This couple goes into the doctor. Husband's not feeling well. So they go into the doctor. The doctor examines the husband. And after the examination, he tells the husband to go out in the waiting room. He says, send in your wife. So the wife comes in. She says, listen, your husband is very ill. Uh, when he comes home, you have to make him three nutritious meals a day. Don't ask him for money. Don't ask him to do anything out around the house. Don't nag him at all. And uh, if you don't follow my instructions to the letter, your husband may die. Right, of course, uh huh. She goes outside. Husband said, What did the doctor say? What did he say? She looks at head. He said, You're going to die. <laughs> That means that there are often unrealistic expectations. Men get married, especially men have these unrealistic expectations about, you know, that she's going to cater to my every wish, women desire. And it's just, un it's just unrealistic. It is, it's all Hollywood that we got this nonsense stuffed into our heads from the, the, the romance. Somebody once said they found a food. There's a food that cures romance, by the way. There's a food that takes away romance, cures romance. You know what it's called? It's called wedding cake. Right? And it cures that illness called romance. Now, as the Rav mentioned, there's nothing wrong. There should be freshness in a marriage, and there should be an excitement in the marriage, and there should be love in the marriage. But the Hollywood idea, we got to get these ideas out of it because it just doesn't happen. Ask anybody who's been married for 10 minutes. It does not happen. It's not that same walk on the beach and the hero finds the girl. It doesn't, that's not what it is. And a person has to go into marriage with realistic expectations. Women also have unrealistic. Women expect, as a word, big word women use, I, I want them to anticipate, right? Women like when husbands anticipate. They're, I got ladies, in this way, ladies, men are bad anticipators, right? They're just not good at it, right? They're not good. Make your instructions clear. How many husbands have said to the wife, I don't, just tell me, I don't have Ruach HaKodesh. Just tell me what you want. I'm not a Navi, just tell me what you want and I'll be glad to do it. I'll do anything you want. Just make your wishes clear, right? But women don't want to make their wishes clear. They want him to be able to mind read, right? And be able to anticipate. It doesn't work. I, I, I failed badly at anticipation. And on those rare occasions that I have anticipated, 
you know, it's, it, it, it just didn't work. There was a blitz coming from the other. It's like a quarterback trying to anticipate a play, and then he gets blitzed from the other direction. Doesn't happen. I think one time I washed the floor. There I was. Yeah, see me? I, did. I, I went without being asked, and I washed the floor. And my wife came in and said something like, oh, you washed the floor? Oh, no, I didn't want the floor washed. Because I, I, why not? You know, well, I was planning on waxing it. You know, something like that. I don't know what it was. I, mess, I said, you know, that's it. that's it. Just ask me what you want. Just tell me what you want. I'll be glad to do it. Just make it clear whatever you want. So I certainly suggest for anybody married, even single, doesn't matter, men especially, I want you one day to look in the mirror, and I don't mean a physical mirror. Ask yourself, those of you who are married, those of you who are married, ask yourself, how would I like to be married to me? You ask yourself that question. How would I like to be married to me? With my unreasonable demands, my stinginess, my impatience, my lack of consideration, how would I like to be married? It's a very sobering question. How would I like to be married to me? And so if a person understands, you know, part of the reason, why, why is this happening? Is a lack of focus. If a person stays focused on marriage, well, I know how I'm supposed to treat her. I know that, you know, I always tell the guys when I give Sean Bice class or when I talk to un, young unmarrieds, I tell the guys, one of the signs of respecting or disrespecting a person is if you interrupt them in the middle. And when you're married, if your wife is speaking, don't ever interrupt her. It's not hard. If you hear her voice, don't talk. Just don't talk. I heard a story about this kid. He comes home. He says, hey, Dad, I got a, I got a role in the school play. He says, oh, yeah, what are you going to be? He goes, well, I'm a husband who's married 25 years. Uh-huh. Oh, maybe next time you'll get a speaking role. <laughs> so the, uh, yeah, the, 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 uh, the, the, the rule is when you're married, your wife is talking, don't interrupt. You don't like being interrupted. Nobody likes being interrupted. So I was once speaking to a group of young guys, and young married guys, and a guy comes over to me afterwards, he says, um, after I said that, he goes, you know, you know, it, when my wife, I mean, you told us not to interrupt, what you, you know, when my wife gets going, I mean, she could really go on for a while. So I said to him, well, that's just too bad, because you gave her a ksuba, you married her, that's part of your obligation, and therefore you are going to listen, and you are going to listen attentively, because that's what you have to do. I said it with a smile, a nasty smile, as a matter of fact. I said, you would, that is what, and I said, and number two, you could go on for a while also. And men often can go on for a while, and when men talk, we expect our wives to just listen to us, like, oh, just, just to be amazed and impressed with everything we say. And that is the most basic form of, that's the most basic form of respecting a person. Your wife has what to say also. By the way, you'd be a fool not to listen to her, and you'd certainly be a fool not to take her advice. And I'm going to get to something very important in a few moments that you're not going to, you may not agree with, but you should. By the way, I had one guy, I like asking guys when they're married, I like asking these guys after a few months, so what have you found in, in three or four months of marriage? I love, I love asking that question. I remember one guy said to him, what, how's, what have you found in your first three months of marriage? He looks at me and goes, I think women are missing the chromosome that makes for effective communication. I said to him, why? He goes, I was taking a shower, and I yelled to my wife that we need some shampoo. Because I was out of shampoo. And she stands outside there, she goes, we don't have shampoo because last time we went shopping, we didn't make a list. We have to start making lists. He says, here I am with my eyes full of soap, and she's giving me a muster schmuss about making lists. He says, I'm telling you, they don't have, they're missing the chromosome for effective communication. Then I had another guy said to him, what have you learned in, your, in two months of marriage, three months of marriage? He looks at me, he's got this dazed look on his face. He goes, D don't make any independent plans. <laughs> right? then, oh, all independent plans, all independent plans are tentative. And a person should learn, you're right. He's absolutely right. For 120 years, don't make any independent plans. I want to tell you something. There was a, uh, there was a man who had been with the Mir Yeshiva. I think you've all heard of the Mir Yeshiva. The Mir Yeshiva was in Poland. Dar Can I have the, the water? I forgot the, sorry. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, sir. I made a bracha before. I'll keep it here. It'll spill. Huh? There's a man who had been. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've spilled. I've spilled lots of water speaking. I was once at an event at a yeshiva at a at a Malava Malka, and I was up the kind of the podium was up high. The rabbanim were all sitting down low. I knocked over the water and I spilled it right on the Rosh Yeshiva. <laughs> yeah, he didn't think it was funny. The uh, neither did I. The uh, um, there's a man he had been with the Mir Yeshiva. Many of you have heard of the Mir Yeshiva. They were in on the run in Europe. They were in Shanghai, and uh, he. And then eventually, you know, they had been running from the Nazis, and they had the miraculous escape, and they were in Shanghai for, for five years, they were in Shanghai, and eventually he made it to the United States. Now this man never made an issue, he got married, he had a family, never made an issue out of food. Food did not matter to him, I guess, after he had been five years on the run, you know, food just was not an issue in his life. And uh, he was there in the, uh, living in New York, and eventually his oldest son was about 18 years old. He sent his oldest son off to, to, to Yeshiva in Cleveland, Cleveland Tells. So after a couple of weeks, he goes to visit his son in Yeshiva to see how he's doing. So he gets to the Yeshiva, and uh, they spend the day, he talks to the rabbis, talks to the, and after a certain amount of time, he's, you know, lunchtime, says, Dad, you want something to eat? He says, yeah, what are you having? He says, uh, uh, what do you call it? Elbow macaroni. He goes, no, no, maybe I'll have something else. Son was shocked. He had never, ever heard his father ever express any interest in food. White meat, dark meat, chicken, it didn't matter. His father never made an issue. And he said, I'd make an elbow record. said, maybe something else. He said, how about some eggs? Yeah, eggs is fine. Okay, so his father ate, and what happened? It turned out he couldn't understand it because his father, for, he, the, the, why didn't he want the elbow? He said, Dad, what's wrong with the elbow macaroni? He said, when he was in Shanghai, Shanghai is very hot and balmy. The food in Shanghai, when they were there, was infested constantly with slugs. And so they would take a few bites and they had to pull the slugs out of the food. And he said, elbow macaroni reminds me of slugs. So I don't want the elbow macaroni. The son was shocked. Because the wife, in 25 years of marriage, was serving her husband elbow macaroni twice a week and he never said a word about it. So you understand that when it comes to marriage, when it comes to marriage, the sensitivity, and I told that story to my mother and my wife, and once Shal Shuddas, that was our Shal Shuddas story, you know, with the lights off, you know, and Ani Mami, and, you know, and everything. I told them, my, 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 my wife, neither of them liked the story. My wife says, if I ever serve you anything, it reminds you of Elba Macaroni, you, of slugs, you tell me. <laughs> and even then you can't. Oh yeah, by the way, this reminds me of slug. Oh, you never like anything like that. You know, you have some pick, you know, one of those. So it, what it, take, it takes it's such an effort in marriage, the sensitivity that a person has to have some, for somebody else. That's, what, that's what's required. But I can tell you that he's probably one of the happiest guys in the world. A man who could live with that sensitivity. And it's like you've all experienced in all areas of life. When you give to somebody, you walk as difficult as giving is, when you give to somebody, you walk away and you feel good about yourself. When you give to somebody, you walk away and you're, 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 you're uplifted. In marriage, a person has an opportunity of 24 hours a day giving. Now, the reason HaKadosh Baruch Hu put the onus of responsibility on men, in my experience, when there's trouble in marriage, when there's difficulty in marriage, 99% of the time it's the men. 99% of the time, it's usually 100, it's really 100%, I just don't want to be too harsh. 99%, why is that? The answer is that a woman, by nature, is a giver. A woman, by definition, is a giver. If a man treats his wife properly, if he gives to her, by definition, she's going to give it back. There are obviously exceptions, there are always exceptions. But if a man gives to his wife, she will almost automatically give back. A woman who gives to a man, men are often the attitude is, well, if a little bit is good, more is better. Men are takers. Women are givers. Do you know that there's a statement in the Zohar that a woman, a little girl, is a woman from the earliest age? It means women have a certain exhibit, a certain maturity from the earliest age. And the same statement says, a man is a little boy always. <laughs> men are little boys. That's what we are. We're just little boys in a bigger body. We're trapped in a bigger body. That's all we are. 
How many men, I remember outside my shear room at Or Sameach, there was construction going on. I was given a Gemara shear. There's construction going on. There's a crane out there. And part of it, I'd be looking outside thinking, I want to get in that crane. Do you have maybe 15 minutes? Just give me 15 minutes. I played with cranes when I was little. I play with cranes right now. Women have a tremendous, by the way, going into marriage, women have a much more mature outlook in marriage. Women understand going into marriage that there's going to be, the men expect they're going to get married, you know, this is it, you know, all my dreams come true. And women understand, somebody once said, you know what the difference is? In a chuppah, when a couple gets married. And this is it, in, in a nutshell. A man under the chuppah is thinking, she's wonderful, and I hope she'll always be like this. Is that true? That's what he's thinking. And a woman is thinking, he's got wonderful potential. That's the difference right there. That's the whole marriage, al regal achas. You are her project. She's not your project. She'll be fine. You are her project. That's the Torah attitude towards marriage. A wife is there. She's an azer kenegdo. She is there to help him, and sometimes she helps him by being opposed to him. Nobody likes to be called out. Nobody likes to be corrected. Nobody likes to. Man, how do you, I'm asked all the time, how do I correct my wife? How do I offer my wife criticism without her getting upset? And the answer is, correct. It, it's right. And I just answered it. You know, it, it doesn't happen. A wife, and men get upset, by the way. Men could get upset. By the way, you ever have, sometimes you get, if you ever seen in a marriage, one of my favorites is when, you, you know, and by the way, Something they talk about, there's another one of today's expressions, verbal abuse. He's abusive. He's verbally abusive. Why? And he yelled at me. He said something like that. That's not verbal abuse. That's marriage. Right? Verbal abuse. You know, the, the minute you raise your voice, I mean, you know, uh, uh, where there are no, no homes where there's ever any yelling, where there's ever anybody getting upset, that's not a home, that's a cemetery. Cemeteries are real quiet. It's either a library or a cemetery. A home's lebedic. It doesn't mean you should. And as you refine your meat, obviously it's not right to yell and you don't raise your voice. Your wife says to you, why are you yelling? Yeah, I'm not yelling. You want to hear me yell? That wasn't a yell. <laughs> well, I'll let you know. You'll know when I'm yelling. Hey, okay, that, that, that's inappropriate. You're not supposed to yell. We'll get there in a second. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, that's, that's the nature. Two people are together who are so different from each other, with such different backgrounds, such different... How can you possibly expect them to agree on everything? Rav Shlomo Zalman Orbach, his wife was Nifter. One of the Gedol Adar. There were 300,000 people at Rav Shlomo. I was at his Leviah. 300,000 people at Rav Shlomo Zalman Orbach's Leviah. 300,000 people. But a, a secular Israeli policeman was overheard at his funeral at Rav Shlomo Zalman's Leviah. There was crowd control, there was a secular policeman. He said, if I knew there would be this many people at my funeral, I would drop dead right now on the spot. <coughs> Rav Shlomo Zalman's wife predeceased him. His wife was Nifter. So he approached the Mita. Shlomo Zalman approached the body, and he said in front of thousands of people, he said, in over 60 years of marriage, there was never an unpleasant word exchanged between us, and therefore there's no real reason for me to ask forgiveness. But it's a tradition in Judaism that the remaining thought, the living spouse, asks forgiveness, and therefore I ask forgiveness. But there's really no reason, because in over 60 years of marriage, we never had exchanged an unpleasant word. So somebody asked one of his sons, how could it possibly be that your parents were married over 60 years and never had a disagreement? The son said, that's not true. My parents, had, my parents had dozens of disagreements. How could two people expect to agree on everything? They had dozens of disagreements. But just because they had disagreements doesn't mean you have to turn out pleasant. Just because you have a disagreement doesn't have to be disrespectful. So you had disagreements, so what? Of course we do. How could you possibly expect everybody to agree? I actually heard once, there's so Zalman, you know, one of the Gdoli Ador, you expect these people to be angels. Rish Shlomo Zaman was once sitting at the table, he had a cup of tea or he ate a piece of cake, he said to his wife, did I make an after bracha? I forgot, did I make an after bracha? His wife said to him, well, you mumbled something, was that the after bracha? Right? So, you know, even, even the gadola, you know, the wives are there to, you know, help you out, but keep you in line a little bit. So the Gemara says, Ova kegufo umechabda yoser migufo. Man has to love his wife as much as himself, and he has to respect her even more than himself. 
famous question is that it's not symmetrical. It should either be he loves her as much as himself and respects her as much as himself, or he loves her more than himself and respects her more than himself. Why is there the symmetry changes? He loves her as much as himself and respects her more than himself. That's the husband's obligation. We'll get to the wife in a second. The answer is because if you love your wife as much as yourself, we all love ourselves. If I take care of my wife, her material, physical needs, as well as I take care of my own, I'll be doing okay. But what about respect? What about respect? You can't talk to a wife, which I told you earlier, the way you talk to yourself. I don't need respect that a man has to look at me and make eye contact with me and agree with me. All I need is his money. Right? I, don't care if he, I don't care if he agrees or disagrees with me. You can't do that with a wife. And with a wife, you know, the, the, it's the thought that counts. Right? Isn't that true? By women, it's the thought that counts. I got news for you. I don't need your thoughts. I don't care what you think of me. Just send a check. Right? Women like a card. They have these, I had a guy once told me, or he was a little older guy. He was a little far tumult. And I met him at a bus stop in Israel. And he said to me, boy, women, you know, I just can't, I can't figure them out. So I said, what's the problem, Herschel? He said, well, it was Hanukkah. And his wife, he came home, and his wife was upset because he didn't get her a Hanukkah card. So he went to the store, I'm telling you a true story, he went to the store, the guy told me this, he went to the store, and the store was closed. So he came home, and he took the Hanukkah card from the previous year, scratched out the date, and he wrote in the new date and gave her the Hanukkah card. He said, she was so upset, I couldn't figure out what she was upset about. So I understood, you know, okay, we got, it. We got some serious issues over here. But for men, you have to respect her even more than yourself. What goes for us? What goes for us, you know, little cuts. Men are always, you know, there's always that male competition. You know, listen, two men, they're always cutting each other. I got a little late for a minion this morning. You know, there's always something like that. There's a jab. Men are always jabbing each other. You can't jab your wife. A little bit. Not too much. It's a different relationship. That's all the kagufa at Makab de Yosef. What's a wife's obligation? The Mar says, Ishak Shera Oser its own baila. A proper wife does what her husband wants. Ishak Shera, ladies, I want you to think about this very well. Ishak Shera Oser, you know what that means? Imagine you're married, you're first married, and every young wife would like to please her husband, and especially show her, demonstrate her culinary abilities. Imagine your husband wants a burger and fries for supper. What do you want for supper? A burger and fries. All right, so you make him a burger and fries. The next night, what would you like? A burger and fries. And the wife isn't interested in making a burger and fries every night, or meat and potatoes. Right? She'd like to do something with some sort of French, French word in it. You know, some sort of E-A-U-X in there, which generally means mushrooms and vegetables. You know, something that, 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 that giraffes eat. You know, and, and the husband, you know, he wants, you know, he's a meat and potatoes guy. Now, Ishik Shera Oser, it's owned by What should a proper wife do? What should a proper wife do? Burger and fries. Imagine the following. This has happened. You know, women have an uncanny ability. Man comes in Thursday night, you go to Mishmar, you come into the house, and you open up the refrigerator, and you see there's a fresh blueberry pie. Wife is fast asleep, and a husband reaches. And somehow women have this ability, in the middle of a semi-comatose state, women have pubs and open the don't touch the pies for the Goldman's Kiddush this Shabbos. You know, you got me right there. Yeah. How did she know? She was fast asleep. She was practically unconscious. And I'm reaching like, <laughs> right in. Oh, what am I going to have? There's some tuna fish in the pantry. So I want to ask you a question. Ishik Shera Oser its own baila. Not what would. Not what would. What should a wife do at that moment? What should a wife do at that moment? She let your husband have the pie, and you'll bake another one the next day. That's what you should do. Now, I'm not talking about what the husband should do. The husband, he should be a trooper, just take a step back, have some cottage cheese and rice cakes, just paint it blue, and they'll be pretend it's a blueberry pie. The wife, what should she do? The wife should she do? Ishik Shera Oser its own baila. Because your husband comes before everybody else. Your husband comes before everybody else. A, I'm again, I'm not talking about what he would do, I'm talking about what you should do. More than that, do you know that it says, Isha tova matana tova labayla. 
A good wife is a precious gift to her husband. A wife is a gift. A wife's a gift. Maybe that's why she gets all dressed up at the chasna. The kind of gift wrapped. Right? A wife is a gift to the husband. Why? What does that mean? The Ben Ishchai says, I mean, it's a shocker. It's a shocker. The Ben Ishchai says, it could be this couple was married in a previous incarnation. Maybe that's why all the conversations sound like we spoke about this once before, didn't we? Either in this or a previous incarnation. And that's how we talk about this already. A husband and wife could have been married in a previous incarnation. The husband messed up, and therefore he had to come back in a Gilgal in this life. The wife got it right. She doesn't really have to be here. She's a matona. She's a gift to her husband. Hashem brought her back a second time to help him get it right this time around. Can you imagine? That's why she's called a matona tova. She's a gift. She doesn't really have to be here. Now, ladies, you just have to be very discreet. This is not something you ever bring up. Like if your husband gets you upset, you don't say, listen, I don't really have to be here. You know, I'm only here because of you. And Kaplan said so. No, no, it's not something, you know, you just, just store it, store it in the memory. You know, you don't, don't bring it up. But you have to understand, you have to understand, Ishik Shera Osir Tzom Bible, that's what marriage is about. And it's sometimes a difficult thing. That's not what I want to do. I want to do something else. Are you, you're doing it for you, you're doing it for your husband. You always have to remember, what is the ikker over here? What is really the focus of the marriage? And in the focus of a marriage like that, there was once a couple that, uh, there was a couple that, they had their 50th wedding anniversary. Children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. And the husband, the, 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 the Bubby and Zeta, the, the patriarch, the patriarch, patriarch of the family, they were sitting at the head table and um, they were bringing out the main course. It was a catered affair, the parents, grandchildren, a large family. And they asked, one of the grandchildren came over and he said to the Bubby, which kind of chicken do you want? Do you want the white meat or the dark meat? She says, I'll take the white meat. The why? Because, because Zeta, he likes the dark meat. He said, I don't like the dark meat, I like the white meat. But all his life, he'd been choosing the dark meat because he knew that his wife liked the white meat. She goes, I don't like the white meat, I like the dark meat. Wow. But all her wife, she'd been asking for the white meat because she thought that he wanted the dark meat. So the grandson said, so both of you lost. So they looked at him together and said, no, no, both of us won. That's how you win. So a person understands, Ishik Shera Oser, it's on Baila, Ova Kigufa, Machab, the Yoser Migufa, that's the key to a successful marriage. Andy, equip, please. So what I'm hearing you say is you should defer to the needs of your spouse. Um, but I feel like if you do that enough, like maybe some point you might turn into you a shmata. You know, you might explode. Like that's so that's an, expo- it's an important point. That's an important point. And what I found is I've been asked many times, this is an extremely important point. I've been asked many times that if a guy just give, you keep giving in, you give in because it's always the advice of marriage. Just give in. Give in. And if somebody once said, if you give in the first ten times, you'll never have to give in again. There's a lot of wisdom to that statement. But everybody has that line because we are human beings. That, you know, and I've been asked, well, if I just keep giving in to my wife, she's going to turn me into a shmata. She's going to take advantage of me. I haven't found that to be the case at all. A person who treats his wife, he gives in, and he treats his wife with respect. So there's kind of respect. But women are good. Women have a very good intuition of knowing when they themselves are crossing a line. You know, a husband who's treating his wife well, and at a certain point, his wife asks her, he says, you know, really, and a wife will often, a wife at that point, she knows that she's, you know, cut him some slack. She knows that. And, and so, so there has to be, everybody has that line. The problem is that men draw the line a little bit too close to their favor. That's the problem. We are capable of doing more. It's not easy. You know, you, when you have kids, uh, you know, you know what's going to happen? When I was going out with my wife, the first thing I said to her is, by the way, I don't do diapers. That was when we were dating. I said, I don't do diapers. She looked at me, she said, I don't either. Now what? <laughs> you know, that was, uh, you know, I did them. I did my fair share. I did my fair share. But she also knows, you know, if a man, let's say the man's working. You know, I, I can't get up at two in the morning to take care of the baby and then go to work. She knows that women are fair. Sometimes you have to take an account. Maybe they don't feel well. Maybe they're exhausted. Maybe they're tired. They, they, it, but, but I have not found that in a healthy marriage that that's a problem. Because in a healthy marriage, then, then because the marriage is healthy, so each one is sensitive for the other one. 
So I haven't found that to be. I, I found that to be a, a problem. But it's got to be. It's got to be with. Uh, you know, it, it's got to be healthy. It's got to be a sort of thing where. To, but I want to make sure this is clear. Uh, that uh, one has to always be thinking about what his wife wants. One has to always be thinking about what what what, what to be. The, a man goes to a wedding. We were told, even as a chazah young, before I was married, when you go to a wedding, you go out for the evening, whatever it is, always bring your wife home something. When you go to a wedding, wrap up a piece of cake, a piece of kugel, and bring her. Now, I want to tell you something. I go to weddings in Israel. If my wife would go to a wedding and bring me home a piece of cake from the wedding, I don't know if you've had Israeli cake. You know, I'm not interested. You know, she bring home a piece of cake. When I go to a wedding, I make sure bring home a piece of cake, bring home a piece of kugel something. Why is that? If my wife would go to the wedding and bring me home a piece of steak or a piece of schnitzel, you know, something else, you know. But if he goes and brings me a piece of cake, I'm not interested because we're the focus on it. When I go to the wedding and I bring her a piece of cake, all that tells her is, even at the wedding, I was thinking of you. Especially when my friend tapped me on the shoulder as I was leaving and said, by the way, bring your wife a piece of cake. And, oh, I'm thinking of her. Yeah. But I, you know, if she's at a wedding, just I, you know, just tell me what time you're coming home. You know, how long, what time I'm off duty with the kids. That's all. Don't forget about the cake. But it's the idea that you're showing her you're thinking about her constantly, 24 hours. That's really what that piece of cake means. Half the time she doesn't need it anyway. It's just the idea that even at a wedding, even when I was in the casino, here I brought you a chip. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking of you, right? It doesn't matter where I was. I was, I was showing you I'm thinking of you. Any, any other questions? Okay, I want to tell you something remarkable. Somebody has a question about it. Yeah, please. Um, how, do you, how do you talk about money in marriage or dating? Or what's the best way to handle money stuff? Sharing money and, like, you own your own money, but he's trying to control how you spend, or he's, you know. Important so question. Money it not only not only you think it's a really big one, it is a really big one. All studies have shown that it is the number one cause of marital strife is money. Yes, 100%. Uh, yes, the advice is, first of all, first of all, the advice it, it works for women and it works for men. A different form of it because the men men in general tend, whether it's right or wrong, this is a fact, is that men feel that they're the ones who control the money, and to a certain extent, the, 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 the financial burden in a home at the end of the day is on the husband. Even if a wife works, from a halachic point of view, the responsibility of supporting the family falls squarely on the shoulders of a husband. So a wife works if she's, in her, you know, if she's gracious enough to work. Nowadays, most families, you can't make it without both working. And, but generally, the, the, from a halachic point of view, the financial burden is on, if a, if a wife quits working, one day a wife says, I, ca I can't work, the husband does not have any halachic recourse. All the halachic uh, husband could say is, thank you for what you've done up until now. In the old days, if a man would not refuse, according to halacha, if a man refused to support his family, back in the day when they had corporal punishment, Bezin could actually flog a man to get him back to work because that's his responsibility. I know, I know you'd like to do so, but we can't do it. Nowadays, nowadays men should be flogged for other reasons. But I've told people that I can settle a lot of show and bias problems. All I need is a whip, right? And take a husband, a husband's not behaving, take him out back in a barn, and I'll have him back, you know, a little physical therapy, and get him in line, right? That's what, that's what it took, that's what it took you to do. Do you know that Rabbi Victor Miller, you've heard of Rabbi Victor Miller? Yeah. Rabbi Victor Miller was once talking to a Puerto Rican uh, gentleman in New York, and he said, well, based on what he sees in New York, there must be a lot of crime in Puerto Rico. So the Puerto Rican said, no, man, no, no, not a lot of crime in Puerto Rico. He said, why not? He says, because in Puerto Rico, if you're spray painting or you're stealing a hubcap or something like that, and a cop finds you, they take you into the police. I'm quoting Rabbi Victor Miller now. I'm not saying whether I agree or disagree. I'm just telling you what he said. He said, in Puerto Rico, if a cop catches you messing with, being involved in mischief, they take you into the police station, and on the back of the door, there's a metal chain. And he brings you in, and they apply the metal chain a few times. He says, okay, now, Julio, you go out there and you behave yourself. He says, in Puerto Rico, there isn't a lot of crime. That's what, that's what Victor Miller said. That's what the Puerto Rican said to him. Obviously, I don't advocate corporal, corporal punishment too often. But in a marriage, when it comes to money, it has to be worked out I'm not, I don't agree with this idea of separate accounts, because separate accounts mean separate lives. There should be a joint account. A husband can put for his wife 
what I would call, I suppose, a separate account. He could call it her own special account. Not because they're having separate accounts, but just that she should feel she has some throwaway money. Because women need throwaway money. That's a need in marriage. Men have to understand that. That a need, you know, a husband says to his wife, why do you need that? He doesn't understand her need. Men, my need, you know, my wife and I agree 100% on spending. We agree 100%. We agree that we do not buy luxuries. We agree that we don't even buy conveniences. We only buy necessities. There's only one problem. What she calls a necessity and what I call a necessity, there's a, you know, if my wife comes home with a loaf of bread, I say, what's with the bread? What's with the bread? We said no conveniences, no luxuries. Right? What, what do you mean? It's bread. Yeah, but there's grass out there, you know. What, more water? <laughs> more milk? Yeah, and men could be extremely unreasonable when it comes to money. Unbelievably unreasonable. There's got to be some framework in a marriage. And again, even within the best of frameworks, there's going to be some disagreement. But at a certain point, there's going to be, the Chafetz Chaim recommends, the Chafetz Chaim, not me, Chafetz Chaim recommends, every husband, imagine you, you and your wife are having an issue in marriage. Let's say, let's say you're having a little bit of what they call turbulence in your marriage. Pay me $300 and I will settle your shalom bias guaranteed for the next th four months. For $300. Would you pay $300 for the next four months of shalom bias? Would you pay 300 bucks for Sean Bice for the next four months? Yes. Good. Take that $300 now and set up a special account for your wife to be able to use that money for anything she wants without you looking over her shoulder for the next three months. And it's the best investment you can make in Sean Bice because you'll have much fewer arguments if you set aside that money for your wife for the next three months because most of your arguments are coming because of that money. The Chafa Zayim calls it Sean Bice money. He calls the shalom bias money if you live in a community as well. Sometimes there's, a, there's squabbles in the shul. Why should we all pay? Why do we need this? Why do we need new furniture? Why do we have to decrease the sale? Why, all the, put aside the money in advance. That's your shalom bias money. You would pay for it after the fact, so you may as well pay for it now. You know, I had laser surgery about 25 years ago, 20 years ago, I had laser surgery. So a guy said to me afterwards, I had laser surgery in Israel. The, what do you call it, the last sick with laser surgery, whatever it was. So a guy said to me, how much was it? So I said, it was $3,000. He goes, wow, that's expensive. I said, hey, I paid $3,000 for a new pair of eyes. Would you, is that expensive for eyes? For 3000 bucks, I got a new pair of eyes. I could see something I couldn't see before. That, that's a, they call that expensive? It's all relative. How much would you pay for Shalom Bias if I would give you a Shalom Bias? You know, I'll give you Shalom Bias right now. Give me 300 bucks. Would you do it? Of course you would do it. Who wouldn't do it? So put aside the $300 in advance. It would be a great investment in Shalom Bias. The problem is that it's got to be discussed in advance, and ladies do have to behave responsibly with money. On the other hand, it's, this is one of the areas where husbands get very, you're 100% right. Husbands can be very, very touchy about it, and husbands can be very unreasonable about it. And it could be because they want to be in control of the money. It could be because there's money pressure, and they're looking at every present. But you know what, man? You know what you have to remember? The Gemara says, the bracha is in the home because of the wife. And I always tell this to the Talmudim. The Gemara says, there's bracha in the home. What, what do you think bracha means? What do you think bracha means in the home? Bracha means guilt. That's what bracha means. Do you have money because of her? Rabbi says, treat your wife with honor and therefore you will get rich. So if you have money, if, you, if it wouldn't be for her, you'd be in prison. So you, the reason, you're, you're getting upset with her for spending money that you wouldn't have even had because of her. Can you understand how unreasonable men could be? Understand that? So she spent a little bit of money, so what? So she spent some money. So you gotta get all the hits and bent out of shape. That's, that's a, but it's a, it's a, it's a, there is no one path solution for it. There has to be clear communication. I don't mean woman communication either. You know, I mean clear communication with the husband. How much can you spend? And that's why it's always recommended that there should be some, there's something called throwaway money. I don't need to go out and spend money. A wife sometimes needs to get out of the house. She just wants to go and spend because spending is enjoyable. There's fine. I've told that my wife. My wife is much more conservative with money than I am. I was a, it was interesting in marriage. One of the fascinating things in marriage is how there's crossover. You start out in certain areas. You know, they ask, do likes attract? Likes, likes attract or attract or opposites attract? 
and you will find that when you get married, the person you marry in certain ways is exactly like you, and in other ways, the person is completely different. There is no one, one who likes to travel.